I learned to survive on Caliban by acting with certainty. And that was a mindset I took with me into the galaxy. I failed my father. I fear I also failed my brothers. I do not wish to fail my sons. You mistrust me and my motives. You have told me so, clearly. You suspect me of a treason at least as great as Horace's, if not deeper. Imperium Secundus, you do not deny it. You are establishing a second Imperium on the corpse of the first. No. 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 I am trying to keep the flame alive. This is not about empire building or thrusting for the main prize. I have an empire already. Ultramar, 500 worlds. Brother, I do this only so that we may persist. Terra may have fallen, and our father may already be dead. Whatever the facts, the ruin storm prevents us from knowing the truth. I am not taking this moment to move to my advantage, and I am not using the crisis as an opportunity to usurp. I am not Lupercal. I am simply keeping the flame alive. If we need another capital world, another figurehead, then let us have one. If it keeps our father's vision of the Imperium alive, if Terra burns, then Macrag lives. The Imperium endures. Do you know the real difference between me and Horace Lupercal, brother? Tell me. I don't want to be emperor. Help me do this, brother. Help me keep what is left together. Help me preserve the human intent. Don't make argument with me and misinterpret my motives. I want to trust you, Rabute, but I have always been wary of your ambition. Your Imperium then, this Imperium Secundus, this great scheme of survival. How do you intend to proceed? Do you intend to declare yourself regent? I do not. I will not found an empire and then crown myself. Such arrogance would confirm every doubt and suspicion lurking in the minds of men like you. I need a figurehead for the public to rally around while I fight to keep the mechanisms of the Imperium turning over and protected. But who then? Surely it must be blood. Agreed. It must be a Primarch. My dear Rabute, there are only two of us here. The Lion and Gilliman meet upon the colossal grounds of McCrag City, crowds and their millions cheering. The Lion and his Dark Angels march in perfect drill. Thousands of warriors, armed with weapons even the Ultramarines had never seen before. The Lion and Gilliman meet face to face in the grounds, Gilliman noticing for the first time that the Lion is slightly taller than him. After a small matter of ceremony, Fafnir Bloodruder of the Space Wolves, honoring the tradition on Dulan faced a Primarch as the Legion's champion, making a sensational strike, caught by the Lion at the last moment. A cut so swift Gilliman admitted it would have taken him off guard. With a backhand the Space Wolf was cowed, an honor satisfied. The brothers walked side by side, with their legionaries in step, onwards towards the fortress of Hera. Side by side the brothers conversed, the lion prying Gilliman about how he had lit a beacon upon McCrag in the war, and if he had found the true source of this war that ravaged the Imperium. The warp. Gilliman replied, both Primarchs dwelling on the ordeals their legions had faced in the years since the Horus Heresy had begun. Trust was a precious commodity, something the Lion had come to verify, as he believed Gilliman had committed a grave sin, usurpation, 
He wouldn't make the same mistake he did with Perturabo again. Within the fortress of Hera, the brothers alone met again in a chamber. The lion noted that this place was a work of emotion, not logic. So unlike his brother. Twenty seats with twenty banners, all from each legion, were draped upon them. Two were left blank. It finally hit the lion that two would never return, and nine would never take their place. Twenty sons would never again sit at the table with their father. The Imperium had changed forever, and the golden era they were building was falling out of reach. But sentimentality would not stop the lion from his duty. Imperium Secundus, an empire forged on the ashes of the old Imperium. Terror was cut off by the warp storms. For all they knew, the Emperor was already dead, so they had to bring together what was left. The tactical choice, but also one of hope. The Lion distrusted his brother instantly. It only reinforced his paranoia of the Empire builder he always knew Gilliman to be. Was he simply another traitor? Not one of the warp, but one of his character. But yet he saw a level of honesty from Gilliman he wasn't capable of, unnerving for a man who kept his true thoughts to himself constantly. The lion saw the merit to Gilliman's plans, but the question remained, who would become the symbol? Who would become the one to bend the knee? Who would become Emperor Regent? Who would become the new Emperor? In a banquet celebration for the arrival of the Dark Angels, the Lion and Gilliman sat with their men until the klaxons boomed across McCrag City. Mass orbital launch, 400 drop pods rocketed towards Gilliman's home. The Dark Angels had begun their assault. The Lion immediately felt a wash of shock rush over him. He had not authorized this. Gilliman and his men drew their weapons, Furious at the impending assault upon their world, Gunnerman looked into his brother's eyes and read the shock on his face. Even if this had been unplanned, the Dark Angels were in waiting. They had put plans in motion to destroy the Ultramarines. Please, the Lion said, holding his brother's gaze. The shields and McCrag would incinerate his men. The Lion swore to his brother he didn't order the assault. The time ticked away until the furious Gilliman relented and allowed the safe landing of the First Legion. Even now it was difficult for Johnson to break that wall he had built so long ago, to be honest with the brother he had so many doubts about. But Gilliman had been honest. Johnson believed him, even if that belief didn't come with the Lion's full trust. He finally explained the source of the unsanctioned drop assault a previous prisoner who had been running rampant upon his ship. Conrad Kurz, the Night Haunter. Gilliman grabbed his brother by the throat and slammed him into a marble wall, shattering the stone behind. The lion kept his hands by his side, as his face finally showed emotion by contorting to a snarl. You brought that monster to my world, Gilliman roared. The Primarch of the Ultramarine's anger was obvious in contrast to the repressed fury of the lion. But his anger and Gilliman's handling of him was nothing in comparison for his failure to capture Kerr since Thramas. The two secrets between the two Primarchs was breaking their bond. They were at each other's throats, just as the Night Haunter wanted. The lion and Gilliman swallowed their anger. The Night Haunter was upon McCrag. He was the priority, and they would hunt him together. In the Sotha chamber room, the Lion and Gilliman chased their insane brother, finding the stalking gaunt creature that was Kurz, taunted by Barabas Dantioch and Alexis Pollux. The latter saved as he was dragged through the light of the Sotha device, the Pharos beacon, the communication and light in the warp for McCrag, Gilliman's secret. The Lion and Gilliman stepped forth alone. They would deal with their brother, too many of their sons' lives had been lost to this monster. The cackling curs faced them, a stark figure of lean, long bones and hollowed frame. He looked like a starving giant, towering yet emaciated. His tattered black cloak flowed from his shoulders as the Lion and Gilliman pushed forward with their blades drawn. The Night Haunter twisted and darted around them, 
prowess fueled by savage madness as the Lion and Gilliman struck out. Metal sang in discordant clashes as Johnson and Gilliman tried desperately to pin down the Night Haunter amongst the marble ruins scattered with their son's corpses. Kerr struck the Lion in the neck, Johnson feeling the grievous wound as Gilliman bashed away the Night Haunter. Conrad's maniacal laughter grew as he began to run, telling the two Primarchs that death would welcome them. Pollux and Dantioch began to roar, to their lead lords to run, as the building around them evaporated into a flare of white, the explosive set beneath by Kurs detonating. All of the Dark Angels and Ultramarines screamed in horror as their Primarchs vanished from their sight. It was all white. So bright even his eyes couldn't see through it. Then a large yellow gauntleted fist reached down to help Johnson to his feet. The hand of Alexis Pollux. Around him was polished black stone. A chamber full of equipment. Pollux, Dantioch, and Gilliman. Sotha. The Primarchs had been teleported to the distant world of Sotha. An act achieved by the Pharos device. The beacon in the warp that had drawn the lion to McCrag. But again for the lion, the paranoia crept in. Gilliman, using technology he didn't fully understand. Things even the Emperor did not dabble with. And even then, trusting his protection to Dantioch, a previous iron warrior and son of Perturabo. But did this concern come from Gilliman's ignorance of this technology, or the lion's own guilt for committing the same sin with the Tacholcha engine? The lion and Gilliman sat upon the sands of Sotha, frustrated as the Pharos recalibrated back to McCrag, angry at themselves for the havoc Kurz was wreaking upon McCrag City in their absence. The lion had never sat still for so long, never been so powerless. With the Pharos recalibrated once again, the Primarchs were in communication with their relieved sons. Gilliman crossed the boundary once again, his emotions at reunifying with his men and his adoptive mother bridging the gap, powering the Pharos device, only for the lion to be stricken with frustration. He couldn't cross. He couldn't will himself over like Gilliman until his brother extended his hand. I need you here with me, brother. The lion stepped through and clasped his brother's hand. The empathic field couldn't read the lion's sequestered, buried needs and hopes. The walls he had placed upon them were his crutch, but Gilliman's need for his brother and his love was enough. The lion placed his other hand on top of Gilliman's, fully aware of the bond between them, one that had been tested, but is still held true. Once again, the Lion and Gilliman set off to find the Night Haunter and the rumored giant who had been seen battling him across McCrag City. Another brother was found upon McCrag, the Lord of Drakes, Vulcan. Vulcan lived. But more news came to the Lion and Gilliman, news that filled both of them with hope. From the edge of Ultramar and space, another fleet crested the heart of the gathering Imperial forces. Ships of gold and scarlet red burst forth. The Blood Angels and Sanguinius had arrived. The three brothers stood vigil over the body of the Lord of Drakes, Vulcan. An unmovable spear of Fulgurite lodged in his chest, pierced there by curs and forces that aided him. Their brother did not rise from this death, and the sight of it broke their hearts. The Lion, Gilliman and Sanguinius sat down together. The events of last night alone have made me value life and kinship more than ever. We have lost another brother, and McCrag, great hearthstone of the 500 worlds, was almost brought low by the deeds and machinations of just one determined traitor. I have witnessed the venom of our enemy. I have seen the sad fragility of those assets and lives that remain to us. Rabuti and I do not think alike on many subjects. We disagree, but we also stand together. Loyal, we fight for the Imperium. Terror was cut off. The Emperor may be dead, but the Imperium had to continue. Johnson saw that now. Gilliman was right. 
They needed to keep the flame alive. And they needed a public figure to rally around. It must be blood. It must be a Primarch. To crowds of millions upon millions. A sky sworn with ships. And banners waving in the wind. Legionaries of black, blue and red stood in parade and saluted. The crowd's cheers were deafening as they looked to the three Primarchs. On the right stood Lion L. Johnson, Lord Protector. On the left, Gilliman, Lord Warden. And in the centre, Emperor Regent Sanguinius. Imperium Secundus was born. I am the Lord Protector. It is my duty to ensure our defense from any threat. Be it from outside or within, there is no greater threat than Curse, a canker right here on McCrag. Perhaps even still within the Civitas, regardless of our brother's assertions. Toys with us, distracts us, perverts us from the goals we seek. While he is here, nothing is safe. Imperium Secundus cannot grow. What are you asking for? I ask for nothing. The lion glanced over his shoulder in irritation and returned his gaze to the Emperor. You have given me what I need already. You appointed me as Lord Protector and oaths were sworn. It is upon my honor to uphold the responsibilities placed upon me. And it is upon yours to let me do so. There can only be one Emperor. The lion whirled about, stopping himself an instant from striking the Primarch of the Ultramarines. Gilliman stepped back, startled. And I will protect him! The Primarch of the Dark Angels roared. He threw out an imploring hand to Sanguinius. Brother, stand by your oaths. Free my hand from the bondage of personal niceties. You entrusted your life to me. Now it is time to prove that trust. What would you do? Ah, oh, Sanguinius. He looked at Gilliman for a second, and then back at the lion. What has our brother not done that you will? Crag has been a fortress from without, but it must be fortified from within. Martial law, a total suspension of contact with any ships that have not been thoroughly inspected. Quarantine, if you will, curfew, searches, surveillance and investigation without limit. There will be no shadows to hide Kurz, no cracks for him to move along, no gaps to fall through. Nothing will pass upon the face of McCrag without my knowledge. The lion slowly closed his fist, as if he held the world in his hand. It is what our brother has done that I will not that is more the matter. And what is that? Shown restraint. It was several seconds of silence before Gilliman spoke, moving past the lion to stand next to Sanguinius. The decision is yours, my lord. I would not allow this. It moves against everything we have sought to build. The new Imperium will never be broken from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. Sanguinius nodded and the lion took in a sharp breath. He was ready to make further argument for his case, but the blood angel met his gaze and silenced him with a look. What you say is true, Robute, but only to a point. Our brother is right. We must each be a pillar of the new Imperium, and if we remove one support, the whole edifice will crumble. Kurz will not stop unless we stop him. With the beacon of Sotha reduced to a fraction of its power, the Imperium will need strength and guidance more than ever, and that is your task. Though we have defeated many foes of late, the war is not over. There are many battles to be waged. It is for this reason we swore to uphold the commands of our brother from Caliban. If he is not worthy of such a duty, then you cannot be the statesman of the Imperium, and I cannot be its emperor. Gilliman signalled his capitulation with a resigned look and a nod of the head. The lion looked at Sanguinius and could only guess at the new Empress' thoughts. 
Was he simply acting as a peacemaker, maintaining the illusion of hope until his foreseen demise? Or did he truly believe in Imperium Secundus, and the part it would play in guiding the future of mankind? Did it matter? Not to the lion. He knew what needed to be done. It had been his weakness, his hesitation on Sogwalsa, that had allowed Curse to escape. This time he would leave nothing to chance. Before the winter finished, Curse would be dead by his hands. It was a pleasing thought, and he suppressed a smile as he bowed to Sanguinius. I will be done, my emperor. You have doubts, brother. The lion stated it without question, and knew Gilliman was required to answer as the two of them paced along a long balcony on the southern aspect of the fortress of Hera. Thirty meters below them, a company of Praesatal Guard marched towards the Port Hera, their footfalls in unison. It was almost dusk, the day spent in long discussion about the Imperium. Sotha, in the preparation for the declaration of Legatus Militant, that would suspend the civil authorities of Macrag and hand executive power to the Imperial Triumvirate. No, I have fears, brother. Grave fears. The lion stopped and looked south across Macrag Civitas. The city was sparkling with thousands of lights as twilight encroached, and beyond he could see the blue plumes of plasma jets rising from the landing fields. He could smell salt amongst the fumes of traffic and people as the wind shifted to come in from the sea. His silence invited Gilliman to continue. Every action begets a reaction. Have you considered that Kurz wants us to assume absolute authority? He wages a different war from us, for objectives we cannot guess at. He is insane, lashing out blindly at any target. A wounded, maddened animal trying to protect itself. You heard Lord Sanguinius's account as well as I did, brother. Kurz's madness has an end game. He seeks justification, affirmation. Retaliation. You are giving him that. The lion thought about this, knowing that he owed his brother the courtesy of proper consideration. The alternative is to let him wreak havoc across Macrag, across the Imperium. Our new Emperor said it. He must be stopped. That is not what he said. Gilliman argued. The other Primarch sighed and turned away, leaning his back against the pale stone of the Bastulate. The practical application of more security brings about consequences that theory cannot predict. Such as? We are asking my legion to stand against their own. This is Macrag, the world of the Ultramarines. Many of my warriors have connections here, family ties. We were never meant to rule directly. You must understand the potential conflict this generates. Unforeseen consequences are just that, brother. What ruin will Kurz bring about if we do not curtail him now? I cannot conceive of such a future. The best thing about the future is that it comes one day at a time. Tomorrow will bring protest. How will we deal with that? You will deal with it, brother. As Lord Warden, it remains your duty. I will be busy commanding my legion. You cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. I evade nothing. The lion looked at Gilliman and could not guess what his thoughts were. It was a hard task the Ultramarine's Primarch had taken upon himself. The Dark Angel sought to alleviate some of that burden, allowing his brother the time and space to perfect the design of his creation. And you need not concern yourself with conflicts of interest. My warriors will show no fear or favor in the application of their duties. Your legion's hands are clean. You cannot mean... Gilliman stared, looking in shock at the lion. You, you cannot bring your legion to Macrag. I have already issued orders, brother. You have admitted that your warriors cannot be trusted to guard their own. You think you can usurp me on my own world? Gilliman was almost hoarse, throat tightened by his distraught state. Our world, the cradle of the new Imperium. Caliban lies beyond the ruin storm, far from my reach. 
half my legion I left under the command of Corswin. I have given up my home, my warriors, to join this endeavor. What are you willing to sacrifice? Horus had tried to take the Imperium for himself, and Gilliman had decided to build a new one. As much as he did not want to belittle his brother, the Primarch of the Dark Angels knew that there could only be one winner in the war to come. There would be no second place. Kurs had to be dealt with at any cost. Any cost. Even Gilliman's pride. The lion stepped close, his voice dropping. Do you trust me, brother? Imperium Secundus. The flame of the Imperium kept alive the other side of the ruined storm. The lion has come to see if Gilliman has betrayed the Emperor, and he finds many things to his distaste. But he recognizes the hope and unity this could bring. But he and Gilliman clash too much. Their own ideas and way of operating grate against each other. Both are neither fully capable of trusting the other completely, nor bending the knee to the other and allowing them to become the figurehead of this new Imperium. But the Lion could trust Sanguinius, for all Emperor like the Lion was in his convictions and demeanour. He could never be the symbol that Sanguinius could be, though part of him desired this authority, the need to push through decisions, not to be accountable to others. The Lion is a warrior, he is a hunter. He recognises that he is best served on the front lines and he recognizes the nobility in Sanguinius, his fairness. The Lion come to terms that Imperium Secundus is the best move, but yet it does not alleviate his worries for the Emperor, for terror, and for distant Caliban which he has not seen for mere decades. He has decided to put all these concerns on hold, and to give Imperium Secundus a true chance. Despite the fact that over the Thramas Crusade, Conrad Kurz many times had taunted the lion that he did not know what was happening upon distant Caliban, that there were rumours of rebellion. But the lion dismisses this, as he has left Caliban in the trust of his adopted father Luther. But the lion struggles with the fact that he has a new master, even if it is one that he has bent the knee to. Sanguinius is fair, but he does not understand the lion in the way that the emperor did. The Lion barely needed to talk to the Emperor. Such was their level of understanding. Their minds were often one. But to Gilliman and Sanguinis, he has to justify and explain himself. Something incredibly difficult for a man who always keeps his secrets. But if Imperium Secundus is to succeed, he needs to trust his brothers. Imperium Secundus. The beacon of hope for the Imperial forces on the far side of the Ruined Storm had met with adversity. The Pharaoh's beacon upon distant Sotha had been broken by an attack from the Night Lords, dimming the light in the war that had called the survivors to Macrag. The Lion had travelled to dozens of worlds within the realm of Ultramar, using the Tatolcha engine, hunting down the rumours of the Night Haunter. Upon many planets, the Lion found warbands of traitor forces, such as the Word Bearers. Seeing now truly the disgusting rituals enacted by those who worship this chaos, desecration, even entire monuments of bone made from the populations of planets. We have come. We are death. We have come. We are death was chanted through the helmet grills of the First Legion as they faced these traitors upon every world, scouring for traces of Conrad Kerr's. Only for upon Johnson's return to McCrag, he discovered that Kurz had never left. The news sent shivers of shock down his spine, and Gilliman believed for the first time. On that face which never showed emotion, he saw a hint of a soul-grinding rage. But just as quickly the lion's thoughts turned to the Emperor Regent Sanguinius. He was unharmed, but had been visited by their treacherous brother Kurz. To the library of Ptolemy the Protector, Warden and Emperor Regent went, discussing how they would deal with their traitorous brother who haunted Imperium Secundus's progress. 
The Night Haunter was insane. Vengeful against the Emperor who he believed had by fate made him a monster. Yet underneath all this was a brother seeking in a way forgiveness, permission. The Lion saw a deep melancholy within his brother Sanguinius's words. The source of it something he would not share. But the Lion even now kept his own secrets. He was not one to pry. The brotherhood between the three Primarchs was showing his cracks. The Lion felt a fury take over him. Gilliman, how could he allow Curse to get so close to their Emperor? Something Gilliman retorted with, where was he? The Lion, he is the Lord Protector. Yet he was off in the stars hunting rumors on his own and keeping his own movement secret from them. His own warden and emperor regent. The lion warned, insult me again, brother, and theoretically I will punch you in your practical face. The lion and Gilliman almost came to blows until Sanguinius stopped them. The lion began to speak up. This triumvirate was holding the imperial forces together. But never before had the lion felt such chains around him. For years now they had tried at Gilliman's way, of negotiation and stability, but now they needed to try it his way. Gilliman was incredible. The lion knew he could give dozens of things his attention, a multitasker and administrator beyond even his capabilities, but he had never given anything his full concentration, like the lion had. That was why he was not the warrior the lion was, and why Gilliman couldn't be trusted to catch Kurz, another Primarch, for he could not give that task his full attention. Sanguinius gave the lion his permission to do what was necessary. The lion had fought Kurz for years. He hated him. He had murdered so many of his sons, and he had brought that monster to Macrag. He would hunt him down just as he'd done to the beasts of Caliban. But just as the Lion gave his declaration to Imperium Secundus, Macrag City began to suffer attacks from within, the Illyrium Quarter. The Lion chastised his brother Gilliman again. Illyrium is non-compliant by any terms of definition. Your planet, the capital of the 500 worlds, has harbored dissident elements since the inception of the Imperium. They are not your citizens, brother. They do not want to be your citizens and will not serve the Imperium. They betrayed and killed your father, Connor. Again, the brothers almost came to blows. Again, the contrast between the Lion and Gilliman flared. The negotiator and the hunter. The Emperor had sent the Ultramarines like diplomats across the expanse of the lost colonies of mankind, bringing them into the fold. But the Dark Angels were destroyers. The Emperor sending them to eliminate Xenos and all other threats. But in Gilliman's diplomatic means, he had made peace with the Illyriums of the past. The ones who had once rebelled, and now again were rife with the resentment the Night Order had used against Imperium Secundus. The Lion wanted to eradicate them from orbit, wipe the slate clean, secure Imperium Secundus, so they could focus on getting to Terra. A point countered by Gilliman, who decried the sanctioning of Illyrium. There were innocent people who lived within. The Lion conceded on some points, but he had made up his mind. He would hunt Kurz personally and end it all. He would accept the enormous risk because only one brother would survive this encounter. Standing inside the streets of Martial Lord Illyrium, the Lion let himself be seen. From orbit, he went against his assurances to Sanguinius and Gilliman. He launched radioactive munitions at the rebelling Illyrium forces, hiding in the mountains. And when the dust settled, he set off for the tunnels that ran beneath, likely walking into the Night Haunter's trap. He was so close, an end to Kerr's in sight. He began to think of the future, a new war master. Such was the prize he called to mind. Sanguinius's vision of death would not come to pass while the lion wielded such terrible might. The triumvirate would be the match of the emperor lost, the power and majesty of mankind's savior renewed. He would take the fight to Horus at the forefront of the legions, the finest augmented warriors dedicated to the most beloved of the Primarchs, recruited, organized, trained, and armed by the greatest logistician in the galaxy. 
commanded by its paramount general. Horus and his ragtag entourage of misfits and dissidents would be shown the true strength of the Imperium. In the dark and damp radioactive halls and caverns, the lion, hunter of the forests of Caliban once again stalked a beast. The who was hunting who was up for debate, sword drawn. The lion stepped into the ruins of a temple. All was darkness within. Just the ambient glow of background radiation and the light that peered down the stepped concentric levels that led down like an amphitheater. It was time for death. One second to midnight. The lion dived as he heard the claws rush above where his head had been. Kurz's nightmarish face was just a meter away. Gaunt. No, more than that. Almost skeletal now. His flesh wasted to white skin and muscle. Not an ounce of fat between surface and bone. His eyes were black, glinting in the golden light of irradiated snow. Thin lips were drawn back in a mad grin, exposing dirty pointed teeth and withered gums. A tongue like a lizard flickered over the yellow fangs. As Kurz melted back into the darkness, the lion traced the steps of the conical circle, the pattern he had learned in Alderuk. The duel between the lion and Kurz was a blur of deadly strikes, Kurz's lightning claws meeting the lion's sword in sparks that lit the dark chamber. Kurz stalked the lion, skitterish taunts and maniacal laughter echoing throughout the chamber. This wasn't the time to play it safe, there was no time there for hesitation, no circumspect moment worrying about a counter-attack. The lion threw himself at Kurz, before he could vanish slashing and stabbing at his foe as he turned to retreat. He caught a glancing blow across Kurz's calf, the tip of the lion sword shearing through the midnight blue armor. Kurz again began to draw the lion deeper within, dashing up the stairs, but finding to his confusion, the lion not following. Kurz had become predictable. A missile from above blasted the stairwell to pieces. Finally, the advantage was his. The lion rocketed forwards, towards Kurz, seizing the ranting and raving beast that was his brother above his head and smashing his spine upon his knee. At his mercy, the lion screamed into his brother's face, why did you betray our father, only to be given answers of no satisfaction. Kurz was at his mercy, the lion had wanted him dead for so long. He could do it, end it all here. But he stopped himself. He was no longer the lost boy in the forest. He was a knight of Caliban. I am no murderer. You will be executed, but not for my vengeance. For justice, I will not make you a martyr, nor vindicate your twisted ideals. In chains, the lion dragged curs before Emperor Regent Sanguinius and Lord Warden Gilliman. The trial of Kurz had begun. The list of crimes against the Night Haunter was vast, but Kurz protested. With venom in his eyes, and with a voice like scraped glass, Kurz exclaimed how could he be tried as a criminal by a criminal, revealing to all assembled how the lion had broken his vow to his brothers, and had struck the Illyrium Quarter from orbit, something he swore to Gilliman and his emperor he would never do. The fury of Gilliman was like nothing the lion had seen before. His brother marched up to him, tearing away his sword from his grip and snapping it in two across his knee. The Emperor Regent Sanguinius dismissed the lion. The triumvirate ended, and the lion left, Kurz's laugh echoing behind him. Aboard his flagship, the lion sat in shame. He had gone too far. His need to complete the mission had blinded him. His mistake with the siege engines with Perturabo. Again, he had let the end goal cloud him. Nemiel, his son who had questioned him, too, fell to that singular mindset. A new war master. How could he have been so foolish? Had the Emperor not warned him long ago not to seek recognition? Was this how Horus had fallen? But in his heart of hearts, had he been so singularly focused, because he never truly processed his brother's betrayals. Does any of it matter, he said to himself. 
A diminutive figure stepped out of the darkness of the throne chamber, a child's height. It wore an ebon robe, its hands concealed with gloves as black as the shadows, but underneath the mantle of two eyes burned like embers, a watcher in the dark. The ones who had advised him at times, over the years, had nothing to offer him now, only more questions. The lion had been banished. To Caliban, the dark angels would return. Maybe there can be some resistance there to the madness that gripped the galaxy. But on the edge of departure, something overtook the lion. Conrad's words. His fate to die as an assassin not born yet. Sent by the Emperor. Immediately, the lion ordered the Tatulcha engine to teleport him back towards the crag. In the throne room, a white light emanated. A Sanguinius's sword almost fell upon Kurz's neck. Johnson and his son Holguin teleported into the chamber, all weapons drawn upon them. Kurz and Sanguinius's visions were true. The lion exclaimed, Kurz would die as an assassin's hand sent by the Emperor in the future. Therefore, the Emperor lived. Terror still stood. The Dark Angels, Ultramarines and Blood Angels assembled. Hundreds of thousands of Astartes, millions of mortal men and three Primarchs launched to the stars. Their destination, terror. They would find a way to break the ruined storm. I am not Horus. No, you are not. And you are not what he has become. But remember, brother, remember what he was. I remember. I remember how wise I thought our father was to make him war master. I remember Horus's doubts, how he wondered if he was worthy of the task. How could this brother turn on us? Remember that none of us saw his treachery coming. Our father didn't see it coming. Remember all of this, and remember that here is where Horus fell. Now tell me, you are certain there is nothing below? He's right. I would like to know what happened to Horus. You think I don't? And if Sanguinius is correct, what then? Is our strategy to replicate Horus's error? Gilliman turned back to Sanguinius, an eyebrow raised. Where do you stand, Robute? I wanted to hear you both out. We have a lot of data, but it does not point in a clear direction. We have just come through unambiguous evidence of the importance of Davin. But the Necrosphere tells us nothing about how we should deal with the problem this world presents. He drummed his fingers on the table. On balance, I agree with the Lion. Our enemy isn't here. It is somewhere in the Necrosphere. You saw it, Sanguinius. You've done battle with it already. We can't fight it until it declares itself. I agree. Destroying Davin may bring it out. In any event, I think a landing here will be a distraction. It will not be. We have to know what is down there. We have to go. He stared at the center of the map. No, they could not understand. There was someone who would, though. I must speak with Conrad. The lion snorted in surprise. You think he will convince me? No. Nevertheless, I would speak with him. As Sanguinius reached the stratagem's door, the lion said, I will take action, without delay. You will be wrong to do so, Sanguinius said, and left. The klaxons boomed through the corridors. The invincible reason was maneuvering into position for the bombardment. I have no authority over you. Nevertheless, I am giving this command. I will not be opposed in this. Sanguinius placed his hand on the hilt of the blade in Carmine. He did not draw it. The act was less a threat than a reminder. He had no intention of harming the legionaries. Physically opposing him, though, was more than they could do. He spread his wings, lifting them high. He filled the corridor and towered over the Dark Angels. Do what your honor demands. Know that the responsibility for what happens now is mine, not yours. These events are beyond your ability to control. The legionaries did not move, but they did not raise their guns. Know this too. What I do, I do for the Imperium. So does the Lion. Nothing that happens now changes this fact. 
Sangonius drew the blade in Carmine and smashed the blade against the helm of one guard, spitting it open and staggering the Dark Angel. He whirled and seized the other guard before he could fire. He raised the Dark Angel and slammed him against the wall, his breath hissing with anger at the necessity of what he did. He struck both guards with the flat of his blade, hammering them into unconsciousness. Forgive me. He turned from them to a small chamber a few paces further up the hall. It was the guard post. He entered it, yanked open a plasteel vault, and took the chains and neuron manacles he found inside. He returned to Kurz and worked in silence, as he transferred the Night Haunter from the wall shackles to the new restraints. The beats of the klaxons continued, counting away the time before Davin's annihilation. No threats. No warnings that I will die if I try to escape. Escape to where, Conrad? Well said. There is no escape for any of us, is there? He took Kurz down from the wall. He shackled the Night Haunter's hands behind his back, but left his legs free. Kurz cocked his head at the sound of the klaxons. I hear the blaring of your time running out. There is time enough. Kurz laughed as they ran past the fallen guards. You do your very best to bring me joy, brother. Sanguinius. The lion shouted through the angel's vox bead. What are you doing? What I must, as you are. But you are wrong. You are setting us against each other. This is madness. No, it is necessary. And it is fated. He shut down the channel, cutting the line off mid-roar. Sanguinius opened a vox channel to his chapter masters. Launch drop pods. Immediate landing in the vicinity of the temple. All forces away now. The lion gripped the arms of his throne. He took a breath, forcing himself to see clearly through the red haze of anger. Ospex, give me a trajectory. What are your orders? Stenius asked. Do we shoot my brother down, you mean? The lion thought. Wood creaked beneath his grip. Damn you, Sanguinius. Damn you for forcing that choice on me. Drag it all the way down. He knew where the angel was heading. He gave the command solely because one was needed. Why did he take Kurz? What sense does that make? He acts according to his convictions. He is wrong. We must act for the Imperium. The fleet is in position. Bombardment targets locked. So noted, Captain. Then Gilliman was voxing. You can't fire now. The lion killed the vox. My lord. I will have silence. The lion told him. The noise of the bridge fell to a murmur. Davin filled the oculus. Its atmosphere streaked by the fires of the drop pod descents. The decision loomed before the lion. He had to make it now. The madness of Sanguinius' actions convinced him even more firmly of the need to destroy Davin. The world was dangerous. It was attacking them even now, even though all the scans still showed no activity of any kind. Perhaps his existence was enough. It was a foul thing, and had to be purged from the galaxy. If this is what I must do then, destroy it and kill Sanguinius, precipitate war with the Ninth Legion, and possibly the Ultramarines as well, that would serve Horus well. And what is the alternative? Stay in my hand and let this madness play out. Allow Davin to wreak havoc. Reach this point only to fall into a trap. The destruction of Davin was an absolute imperative. If he had any doubts left after Epimos, they would have been burned away by Sanguinius' actions. The corrupted worlds must die, and Davin was the source of the corruption. Give the order, said the inner voice of brutal necessity. You know what must be done. The lion nodded to himself. Captain, prepare to- He stopped. His blood froze at the enormity of what he was about to say. Cancel the bombardment. Prepare for a mass landing. We are taking Davin. The lion stormed from the bridge. He marched through the corridors, his fury warning all. Legionary and mortal from his path, he did not stop until he reached Kurz's cell. He dismissed the guards. He had no good reason for having come here. He hadn't consciously known where he was heading at first. He stood in the cell and faced the wall, staring at the empty manacles. He blinked and held up his right hand. 
There was a faint tremor in his fingers. So close. He whispered. He had come within a word of murdering his brother. A word. A malign influence has been working on me. An influence too subtle for him to feel its effects and resist them. Slowly and patiently, it had been leading him to ruin. The lion closed his eyes for a moment. When he opened them, the cell seemed too welcoming, as if he had come here to condemn himself. He grunted and stepped into the corridor. He slammed the door closed behind him. He felt no freer. There were chains around him, all the stronger because he was not sure of their nature. He voxed Gilliman. Rubute, you must beware. What have you done? You can't bombard! I am not. The lion interrupted. But I almost did. Gilliman fell silent, absorbing the implications. Rubute, beware of yourself. Do not trust your impulses. Be sure of your decisions. I almost destroyed us. Davin, the world where it all began, the place where Horus fell to chaos. The Lion, Gilliman, and Zanguinius for years had tried to break through the ruin storm, finally coming into contact with the truth and the horrifying acts their brother legions have committed. Where early on in the Horus heresy, the Lion simply believed this was a human rebellion, and now he finally comes to terms with the truth that the source of this rebellion, this corruption, is from the warp, and it is unnatural. The Lion and his brothers have faced many threats, even coming into contact with the rippling wall of chaos on the planet of Pyrax. Many foul rituals dedicated to dark gods, and the scars of this so-called pilgrim that was traveling around the systems between Davin, leaving rumors and death. But finally they reached above the surface of Davin, and now that they are here, the Lion wishes to destroy it to not even interact with this chaos. The secrets behind this Davin and this chaos truly frustrates the lion. He can't see through it, and in his frustration he has closed himself off, retreating into the surety of annihilation. This surety draws an offhanded comment from Sanguinius, who compares the lion's own to Horus's, something that truly angers the lion perhaps because there was a grain of truth to it. The lion is determined to destroy Davin, despite what his brothers have said, until Sanguinius breaks the Night Haunter out from his hold within the Dark Angel ships. Sanguinius tells the lion that he is wrong, and that he needs his brother's prescient abilities, and they will assault Davin. He will find the truth. The lion sits with his finger on the trigger, ready to destroy Davin, but the Ninth Legion with it too, even his own brother. He comes so close to that moment, until finally he snaps out of it. His hands begin to shake. He walks to the prison where Conrad Kurz had been kept, thinking that he deserves to be here too. His distrust, his paranoia, all of it had been building throughout the Horus heresy, and in a moment where he came so close to murdering a brother, Finally, his paranoia and distrust has caught up with him, and he feels shame for his actions during Imperium Secundus and for what he was about to do. He saw now that his surety was an escape, something he dived into to give him confidence, because since the heresy had begun, in his heart of hearts he had been second-guessing every decision he had made. He had retreated into stubbornness, and that was his weakness. He needed to trust. He needed to hear the wisdom of Sanguinius and Gilliman. He needed to believe in them. The Lion ordered the Dark Angels into the drop pods. They would assault Davin together. The journey to Davin had cost thousands of lives, as the forces of chaos had confronted them at every step. The Lion and his brothers had entered into the Necrosphere. The megastructure boneyard of the infinite floating in space. It contained more than the skeletons of beings that had once been alive. 
They were the skeletons of dead vessels, of cities and of worlds. The inanimate had turned to bone, iron and stone, alloy and gas. Everything was bone and cold and grey. The planets had rib cages now, and cities had skulls. It was the death of all dreams, the past and present and all to come. All the hopes died in the necrosphere. The lion, Sanguinius, Gilliman and Conrad Kurz in chains, walked up to the gates of the Serpent Lodge on Davin. Twilight had fallen, and two colossal iron doors formed the entrance to the temple. They were rusted, their engravings of two serpents entwined around a spreading tree was worn down. The dust around them was red, the stone was red, but in the gloom of the evening all was grey. Amongst the abandoned rubble, the lion and his brothers saw nothing, but Sanguinius pleaded with them to see the greater pattern. Davin was a fulcrum, fate changed here with Horus, and it would with them. Chaos had seen to that. The boneyard of sentient life. The necrosphere was designed to convince them that all here was dead. How close had the lion had come to bombarding the planet and the blood angels with it? Could he see now that Davin was designed to corrupt them? But though the lion had come close, they all still stood. They were being manipulated, the lion recognized. But Sanguinius saw they still had a choice. They could defy fate. With those words, a portal opened in front of the brothers. Sanguinius stepped in as Kerr screamed, the revelation of choice melting his worldview. The war portal held their brother as demonic forces began to attack. Creatures of nightmare emerged upon Davin and in the stars as finally the rumored destroyer revealed itself. The Pilgrim, the Veritas Ferrum, the Iron Hand's flagship, and others of missing Astartes' fleet vessels, bloated and corrupted with demonic power surged towards the Loyalist fleets. The Lion and Gilliman were frozen, and in frustration the Lion attacked the temple grounds, causing a flicker within the portal. A weakness. Johnson and Gilliman lunged forward, and began to strike at the corrupted stone. Dust and shrapnel rained on the Lion's shoulders. A blast of demonic light hit him in the chest, scarring his armor. It forced him back half a step, but still he pushed on, as two demigods broke apart the temple grounds. It had to be them. It was symbolic. The act of two brothers saving another confounded the power of demonic influence, as if belief itself was just as important as the physical blows. The journey to Davin had been as much symbolic as physical. There was a principle to the warp and its denizen that the lion could still only see imperfectly, but appeared to be in the order of a reification of the abstract. Ideas became things, symbols became fortresses, and so he had to fight the demonic on the very ground that it gave so much power. The forces of the Imperium, land and sky battled hell itself, until finally Sanguinius emerged from the portal, locked in combat with a greater demon of chaos named Madial. The Lion and Gilliman charged at the greater demon, to join their brother, slashing and maiming the beast with everything they had. The lion once again slaying a great beast, but despite the efforts of the lion and his brothers, they couldn't destroy this creature, until the noble sacrifice of Sanguinius's herald pinned the demon in place. The demonic storm turned in upon itself, as the fleet finally unleashed their payloads upon Davin, the place where the heresy had begun annihilated from this universe. The corrupted bloated fleet eviscerated as the lion and his brothers retreated back to their ships. The boneyard of life itself, the necrosphere began to dissolve away. Davin died. As the lion heard the cries from his navigators that the light had returned, the warmth of home, terror, terror, terror they cried. The lion Gilliman and Sanguinius convened. The road to terror was open. The war blockade had been overcome, but not the forces of Horus. Only one of them could make it back to terror. Sanguinius, eager to meet his destiny, would go. Gilliman would tie up the traitor fleets, but the lion would go elsewhere, 
to the homeworlds of their traitorous kin he would voyage. Perhaps the destruction of that which they valued most would draw the forces away from the siege. The Lion had come to learn the value not of conquest, but annihilation when it came to this chaos. The Lion looked upon his brother Sanguinius, knowing the fate he would meet at Horus's hands if destiny played out. He looked to the brother he admired and loved, knowing that they would never meet again. With the power of the Tatolcha engine, Chemos, Barbarus, Colchis, and Chthonia burned, their people and history white from the material universe. The Lion himself questioning whether these acts blurred the line between tactical strategy or vengeance. Traitorous forces across the Imperium were annihilated in a crusade until the Lion approached the planet of Kiavar, the homeworld of Corvus Korax and his Raven Guard, finding alive his brother Korax and a face he was not pleased to see, Lehman Russ. The Lion had his doubts. Why did his brothers not make their way to terror? Why were they not on the front lines? But despite the Lion's doubts, they were loyal an assets he could take with him on the crusade of vengeance, and then to terror. Finally, the Lion and his allies roared their way towards the throne world, the light of the Astronomicon a building hope, only to be crushed as they arrived. The War Master Horus had been slain, the traitors had been scattered, but his brother Sanguinius had been slain. The Emperor was mortally wounded, and interned upon the Golden Throne as a Carrion Lord. A grief, so deep, so profound, washed over the lion as he felt the dream and his oath die. All is ended, and all is madness, and nothing remains but vengeance for all scores. The lion said to Russ, his anger so blinding the world blurred around him as his jaw clenched so hard his teeth almost broke. You should have been faster. It was your pride that kept you in the void. The lion roared at Russ, drawing his sword, but Russ didn't raise his arms, seeing in his brother's words a condemnation of them both. The shame. The lion ran his brother through, Russ accepting the grief and shame the lion needed to exert with the blow. They had failed, and for a moment, the lion unleashed the beast born upon Caliban, the one he had hidden underneath the layers of knightly oaths and training. The wound on Russ would heal, even if the shame of failing the Emperor would not. The Lion and the Dark Angels felt a quiet descend over them, a shattering truth that humanity was so close to a golden age, but now there would only be war. The traitorous forces that lingered in the galaxy needed to be purged, and for this the Lion would finally return to Caliban, ready for reinforcements and to see his homeworld. Into Caliban night space, the scarred vessels of the Dark Angels returned. The Lion once again looked upon his true home, and hailed the man he had left its care in, his adopted father, Luther, only for the guns of Caliban to come to life with hateful fire. The Lion and the Dark Angel in space felt their ships rock as Luther and Caliban attacked their own. The Lion was confused. This was Luther. This was his home. They had been betrayed by their very own. This was the machinations of chaos. It had to be. The fury of the lion was unlike anything the dark angels around him had ever seen. The lion orders men to attack the traitors, and like tears of fire they rocketed down towards their homeworld. Angel fighting angel. The destruction upon Caliban was brutal, as thousands of dark angels raised under the manipulation of Luther threw themselves to the veterans of the Horus heresy. The lion cut through the swathes of legionaries raised on Caliban, some who had never even seen true battle. Finally, the lion came face to face with the man who had raised him, Luther, only to see a twisted, bloated monster infused with the power from the dark gods. What had happened to Luther in his absence? Upon that face that struggled to show emotion, the first signs of despair showed. A titanic duel began between the two within the walls of Alderuk, munitions and bombardments all around them. Swirled with the power from the Dark Gods, Luther mashed the prowess of a Primarch. The clashing of steel and ceramite between those who had once been brothers ended, 
as the lion disarmed Luther. The lion had the resolve to execute his own sons, even to kill a brother Primarch. But here, looking upon his father, his brother Luther, he hesitated. An opportunity seized upon by Luther as he launched himself again at the lion, emanating a psychic attack that mortally wounded Lionel Johnson. Decades of resentment, of abandonment had built up to this moment, and when finally Luther had the man who had taken his achievements from him, in his grasp he too hesitated. He was killing his son. He was killing his brother. What had he done? How could he let himself be corrupted like this? The prize of the lion's death was ripped away from the Chaos Gods, and in their fury they launched a warp-infected attack upon the crumbling battlefield that was Caliban. The planet began to break apart, and those fallen, the Dark Angels that had sided with Luther were scattered across space and time. But before Lionel Johnson, the Lord of the First, could be found, the Watchers in the Dark, the Xenos Protectors of Caliban intervened, grabbing the mortally wounded Primarch and taking him to safety in their own sanctums. The Lord of the First was now believed dead, lost to his legion and the Imperium for the millennia to come. I failed my father, the lion says, the words coming unbidden to his lips. I fear I also failed my brothers. I do not wish to fail my sons. Your sentiment is somewhat late, the rearmost warrior says caustically. The lion looks over the marks on his armor, placing him. Knight Sergeant Afgar, it is good to see you again. I cannot say the same, Afgar replies. His finger is not far from his bolt gun's trigger. The lion suddenly wonders how wise this meeting was. He is unarmored, and even a Primarch has reason to fear a point-blank blast from a plasma gun. I presume Zavriel will explain that I place no onus on you to come here. I was deceived by Horus for years, but he pretended to be loyal to the Emperor. I was deceived by my brothers, and I was deceived by the powers they served. When I returned to Caliban, it seems that many of us were deceived again. I witnessed Luther wield foul sorcery of the kind I had only seen used by the traitors. But I now believe that many of my sons who were on that planet with him had been deceived as well, and knew nothing of his fall. I am trying to see past deception to the truth and leave recrimination aside. It is very convenient that you should come to this conclusion now you have returned to an Imperium in ruins and seek to rebuild it once more. Afkar says sarcastically. He removes his helmet and his dark, distrustful eyes lock onto the lion's own. Where was the benefit of the doubt when you had most of a legion at your back? I learned to survive on Caliban by acting with certainty. That was a mindset I took with me into the galaxy. It evidently was not foolproof. Perhaps burned as I was by betrayal and grief, I reacted too swiftly and with too much choler. However, Caliban fired on its own brothers without warning. If you truly believe the fault was mine alone, why are you here? Can this truly be our Primarch? The swordsman interjects, waving the hand that does not rest on the pommel of his blade. His height is right, Zabriel, but his visage is much changed, and he is less vengeful than I expected. The lion's temper flares, had been spoken of in such a casual manner, but he keeps a firm grip on it. Knight Commander Kai, I see your humors are unchanged. Thank you, Kai says, stretching a slight bow. That was not necessarily a compliment. That depends on how accurate one's opinion of me is. Kai draws his power blade. I see you came armed, my Lord Lion. I wonder whether your skills have decayed as much as your face has aged. If he wishes us to follow him, then I wish to test him in the only way that matters. After all, I was always best with a blade in the Legion. Causewain might have given me some trouble, but uh, only on his better days. And besides, he is not here. He activates his blade. There is no further warning, 
no salute with his weapon or statement of intent. He simply attacks. The lion steps back from the first thrust and draws fealty on pure instinct. The power field crackling into life, just in time to deflect Kai's second swing. The former knight commander is pressing forward aggressively with speed, switching between single and double-handed grips from moment to moment, his every movement an attack. However boastful Kai's claim about his preeminence within the Legion may be, they are not entirely without merit. He is undoubtedly an expert swordsman. The lion has waded through a host of foes with nothing more than his armoured hands, and slain members of the traitor legions and their younger kin on Kamarth, with fealty without pause. But none of those foes possess Kai's ability. The lion circles to his right, but Kai's footwork is excellent, and his attacks do not relent. The lion slaps the point of his opponent's blade aside just before it grazes his chest. Kai has come close to landing a blow three times, despite his reach disadvantage. And this is because he's leaving himself open. The lion jugs his blade back from the instinctive thrust that would take Kai in the side. The unnatural movement spoils his balance for a moment. Kai seizes on the opportunity and presses hard, fainting for a strike at the lion's face and then changing it to a chopping blow, which nearly leaves the Primarch's right arm truncated below the elbow and fealty lying in the grass. Do you want me to kill you? I am attacking you! Why would you not? The lion makes a grab for Kai with his free hand and nearly loses it. Will you fight me? Kai roars, swinging for the lion's head. Where is the Emperor's foremost warrior? The lion leans backward to avoid the blows, knocks aside the next thrust that comes for his belly, and lashes out with a kick. His bare foot connects flush on Kai's chestplate, and knocks the former knight commander backwards through the air for some ten feet. Kai lands in the grass with a thud, but he is back on his feet within a moment, his sword still in hand. Now, however, the lion is moving into the attack. He does not aim for Kai's body or head, for he suspects that his son will not be guarding himself. Instead, his next strike is for Kai's weapon. The power blade is knocked to one side. Kai manages to hold on to his sword, but the next blow knocks it from his hand completely and the lion brings fealty to point up rest a finger's breadth from Kai's gorget. Do not test me again! The lion growls. Kai kneels and removes his helm, but the face so revealed is smiling. Forgive me, lord. Words of reconciliation are easy to utter, but little reveals the spirit like swordplay. You could have killed me, but did not. If your intentions are to safeguard this world, and others, then I pledge my blade to you once again. What if I had killed you? Then my companions would have known that your words were empty. Kai says. The lion snorts. He remembers Knight Commander Kai as a braggart, about whom it was whispered more than once that he might belong in the Emperor's children, but also as a warrior who would never ask anything of others that he was not willing to attempt himself. The first legion as it was will never exist again. Adaptation is critical. I will not rule. I have no wish to. I will command those who are willing to be commanded, and I will lead those who will follow. I know Kai, and he has said his piece. Lohawk has also given me his answer, and with your recommendations, I will accept him. What of you, Afgar? Afkar's jaw works for a moment, but he finally mag-claps his bolter to his thigh and straightens. You will give the same opportunity to any of our brothers whom we might encounter. If they are corrupted, I will not stay my hand, but I will not make the same mistake I did on Caliban and assume corruption without proof. We are all out of step with the Imperium. Determining the exact nature of those differences and the reconciliation of them is for a time when humanity is not threatened by extinction. He raises his eyebrow. Afgar? Afgar still hesitates, but when he does move, he moves swiftly. He drops to one knee quicker than either of his brothers, as though finally succumbing to a heavy weight, or as though perhaps a long-held tension has finally been released. If you are not who we thought you were, then we were fools. 
Fools who fired on their own battle brothers for no reason. Say not for no reason, the lion says. He tries to keep his tone neutral, for condescension could be as counterproductive as his anger. Say that you were deceived, as was I, and that you now have the opportunity to atone for whatever mistakes you feel you made beside me, instead of from the shadows. Afghan nods. I will not spurn this opportunity. The lion takes a deep breath of the night's air, savoring the smell of the plants. They are a welcome reminder of the forest of his home, without any of the threat. Come with me, my sons. We have a campaign to plan. The lion awakens into a realm that resembles the broken Caliban. He looks upon a reflection and does not recognize what he sees. The face that stares back is old and withered. Despite being armored in a master-crafted powered armor, he feels weaker, lesser than he was during the heresy. He stares out onto a lake, seeing a disheveled gaunt figure that sits in a boat surrounded by four dark creatures that swim in its murky waters. He wades in, only to be stopped by a watcher in the dark, telling him that he is not ready yet. He does not remember who he is, and despite him asking questions, the watcher tells him to simply follow his nature. The lion begins to push deeper into this Calibanite-like forest, until finally it begins to transform and he finds tainted beasts that are attacking humans. The lion's instincts kicked in, and he rushed forward, slaying the beasts with his hands, and then following the humans back to their camp. Upon reaching the human camp, he finds Zabriel, a dark angel who was upon Caliban when it was attacked. The last time Zabriel had seen the lion, the lion was attacking Caliban and him, so he lunges forward only to be subdued by the lion. The two begin to talk, and finally some of the lion's memories seem to come back to him. The lion feels sick to his core. One moment he was battling upon Caliban's surface, against his adopted father Luther, and now he has suddenly peered 10,000 years into the future, into a grim, dark, rotting Imperium. The lion feels that the Emperor's dream is dead, and that the Imperium he fought for is gone, and his heart begins to change. The Lion joined the Emperor and became a conqueror during the Great Crusade, but that dream and Imperium that he fought for was gone, so he decided to revert back to his true nature, his own desires, to be a protector, just as he was upon Caliban during the Knights of the Beasts. And just like upon Caliban, if humanity was stalked by beasts and monsters, he would slay them, and he would protect humanity. I failed my father. I fear I also failed my brothers. I will not fail my sons. Lion's body had aged. Despite him being unconscious during most of it, Zabriel can see that he has matured along with it too. The obedience demanding, quick to act, barely contained fury wrapped up in a knightly order, was gone. Humility had taken those things from him, because there was nothing more humbling than being truly alone. Zabriel could see that in truth the lion felt lonely, and it would be this warrior, this protector, that would ask for help, not demand obedience. This humble warrior would ask for help from Zabriel, Lohok, Kai, and Afkar. He had changed, and so they would follow again. The misunderstanding of Caliban's destruction was forgiven. Ten thousand years has passed. The Lion has returned to a rotting Imperium that is so far from his father's dream. He has faced corrupted marines of chaos, and has seen in the night sky the Cicatrix Maledictum. Once again in his life he is cut off from the light of terror. He wishes to see his father, but if terror is out of reach, he resolved to be his true self. He is no empire builder like Gilliman. He is a warrior. He is a protector. 
to the world of Kamarth. The lion has found himself after wandering through the forest he recognizes similar to that of Caliban's. After finding the human survivors of this world, of a planet ravaged by the spawning of the Great Tear, the lion found Zabriel, a dark angel who had been there on Caliban during its breaking, fighting against his Primarch in the ignorance of Luther's corruption. But with the truth revealed, and the misunderstanding between the two cleared up, Zabriel and the people of Kamarth pledged to follow the Primarch. The lion was directionless, but the people of Kamarth gave him purpose, and after months the lion and his ragtag force cleared the world of the taint. But as the lion and his men walked throughout the forest of Kamarth, it started to shift. The trees and foliage became darker, more haunting until the lion and Zabriel recognized a similarity with that of Caliban's. The group kept walking until the forest began to melt away into the sands of the world of Avalus. The lion again felt uneasy. He had traversed over an entire system, but now he put the pieces together. That the Calibanite forest was not like that upon Kamarth. It was somewhere else, perhaps not even within the material universe. A place where he had been locked away for 10,000 years. Was this his ability? Was it something he could control? Was it something that could be a powerful asset on the dark side of the rift? The people of Avalus looked on in awe, as a being that dwarfed even the Emperor's Angels of Death. The Space Marines walked amongst them, and when it was verified that it was a Primarch that stood before them, they fell to their knees, praising the demigod son of the God Emperor of Mankind. Despite the idea of his father being worshipped as a god sickening him, the lion kept his true thoughts within. Not ready to fight on that front, the people of Avalus began to cheer. Tears rolled down their cheeks as a living myth had come to save them. They offered up their service and lives to the son of the emperor. But the lion refused. I will not rule. My only intention is to clear the stars of the filth that preys upon humanity. Will you grant me command of your forces, so that I may do this? He did not recognize this Imperium, and he was no lord. He had no wish to rule, but he had a wish to save it. He would not be their overlord, their tyrant, but an ally. Amongst furnishings not large enough for a Primarch, the Lion spoke with Zabriel instructing him to find more of his brothers, more of the fallen. Zabriel returned in the night, the lion meeting within the governor's twilight gardens, unarmored but armed. Zabriel, Lohok, Afkar, and Kai, dark angels who had been on Caliban during its destruction, were now called the fallen by their modern dark angel brothers. The destruction of Caliban had scattered them throughout space and time, for some, they had wandered a rotting Imperium for centuries. For others, it had been mere decades. Thousands of warriors who were diverse in their beliefs as their allegiances. Some had fallen to the corruption of chaos. Others were bitter at their seeming exile on Caliban during the Great Crusade, but were still loyal to the Emperor. Others had been tricked, taken in by the lies of Luther and his command squad. The Lion wouldn't make the same mistakes as he did before assuming corruption without proof. If they were corrupted by chaos, he would not stay his hand, but for those who felt remorse, and never willingly forsook their oaths could be forgiven, just like he could. The lion would not rule. He only wished to serve humanity, and it would accept those that would follow. The lion needed his sons, and he and they needed the focus of a greater goal to give their life purpose again. They would be humanity's protectors, and it would begin with an ashopathic blast to the galaxy that the Lion had returned, and it began with the defense of Avalus. From the void, ships with corrupted silhouettes made their way towards this world. A future victim for the 10,000 Eyes, a chaos warband, the same monsters who had once ravaged Kamarth. Arraying the Imperial fleet before the renegade Astartes vessels, the Lion saw he was outnumbered and outgunned. Anything less than a Primarch's capabilities gave the Imperials a sliver of hope. 
This time, a monster walked into a trap set by the lion. The Imperial fleet sprung forth, using asteroid cover and overlapping vectors of fire to split and take on the enemy vessels one by one. To the astonishment of the 10,000 eyes they were losing, so they became desperate. Reckless enemy teleportations flared upon the lion's bridge. The Lord of the Fur stepped down from his seat, his new sword fealty in hand, and charged at the chaos terminators upon his vessel. His prowess was not what it once was. His body was aged. He had to plan and fight with more precision and care, lest he be overwhelmed. The lion fought the marines infused by chaos, so he used that against them. The power of the blood god was invigorating, but their fury blinded them to tactical decisions. Johnson separated them, using their blows against each other, until the last was cut down. His armor had taken hits, but the lion stood victorious. He opened a Vox message and sent it out, that he, the lion, had returned, and the same fate awaited those who attacked. The renegade fleet began to turn upon itself. Knight Captain Bors and his men, more fallen had seen, and heard their lead lord and answered the call, turning their guns upon the ships they had been uneasy allies with. The desperate defense had turned into a chase as the renegade fleet crumbled, broken apart by the genius of a Primarch. The dark side of the rift once again felt the power of a son of the Emperor. The lion had been victorious, but this was a temporary reprieve and the 10,000 eyes would return. De-armored, the lion sat in meditation, attempting to clear his mind. His mind was beyond human. A genius handcrafted by the Emperor to lead humanity across the stars. He could do almost anything, except clear his mind. It was almost impossible to switch off, to not think of his life, of Caliban, the Crusade, the Heresy, Luther and the now modern Imperium. He had barely had time to reconcile all these things. He concentrated on his breathing pushing the memories from his mind until he opened his eyes, once again looking upon the Calibanite forest. Within a structure that seemed out of place, the lion found the emaciated king again, the one from the lake. He was wounded, gaunt, and circled by four dark creatures. Blood trickled from the being the lion suspected was a manifestation of his father, the emperor. The hollow look from the gaunt king unnerved the lion. The figure did not even truly look at him. He had not asked the right question, the lion thought, as he tried to gain the figure's attention. But again the shadows rose, attempting to swarm the king. The lion stepped back, his vision clouding as it faded back into the material universe. Following the fleet engagement, more of the fallen were drawn to the rumors of the lion's return. The lion descended down from his ship rampart, marching forward to an array of fallen dark angels. The expression on their face is one of contempt and hesitation. They asked if he had come to kill them. Such a direct accusation that never would have been spoken out loud in the Legion of 10,000 years before. One that would have been met with a swift reaction. But the lion pressed down that urge. The Imperium had changed. His sons had changed. He had changed. The Imperium is by all accounts gravely flawed, but many of the people within it bear no responsibility for that. They are beset on all sides by ravening Xenos we failed to exterminate, and by foul powers to which our brother legions, and indeed some of your own battle brothers, enslave themselves. Should we leave these mortals to reap the consequences of their forebearers' decisions, and the failures of the Legioniones Astartes and the Primarchs. It wasn't about blame or forgiveness, it was about hope. About doing something for humanity. Many of the Lion's sons before him were skeptical. Here stood the Lord of the First, aged, but still full of vitality. Should they look to the past, sit in bitter resentment, maybe even fall to chaos as some of their brothers had? Or did they need a new purpose? Could they choose to be humanity's protectors again? 
The fallen angels of the first pledged themselves to fight alongside their lord, to be his ally. But in the wake of this moment, when the lion felt a piece of the life he had had before return, the news came in. Kamarth, the world where the lion had emerged back into the material universe, the home where Zabriel had protected the people, had been burned. Above the carcass of Kamarth, the lion, his fleet and the growing risen angels gathered. More had come in that time, such as the librarian Bevden, one whose loyalty had been competed with with the architects of Kamarth's destruction. The Ten Thousand Eyes Warband, filled with some elements the lion would learn of his own fallen sons. Kamarth's destruction had been a message, and the set for an ambush by the true leader of this warband, Lord Serifax, sitting in his bastion upon the world of Sable. The lion sat in meditation once again as the fleet moved towards Sable, the frustration building as he looked to Zabriel, who easily entered into a state of emptiness. Johnson, even from his earliest days in Alderuk, with his father figure Luther had been exceptional. He was on instinct a genius, and though he had trained to become a knight, to be a Primarch in the Emperor's armies, he never found himself starting from scratch. To empty his mind felt impossible. He wondered if this was how base humanity felt when trying to learn anything, as for once in his life he struggled to grasp something. He slowed his two hearts down. He matched the breathing of Zabriel and pictured the Calibanite forest realm, its winding path that allowed him to travel worlds, to return to the universe after 10,000 years. If he could harness this gift, it would change everything, and he didn't have long to master it as his forces approached Sable. Above the world which was once Sable floated a fortress of bone, forged from the population of an entire planet. The Ten Thousand Eyes forces arrayed around the Bastion, outnumbering anything the Lion could bring. Orbital defenses and hordes of mutants, beastmen and warriors of chaos stood ready, only for the klaxons of the Bastion's inner sanctums to blare. The Lion and his band of Risen had slipped through, traversing the forest path right into the heart of their enemy's hold. The Lion pounded down the corridors towards Serifax, the hunter chasing down his prey as his men battled the Chaos Marines. Everything in his path was cut in two, faster than the eye could blink, until the lion chased Seraphax into a chamber room. Great sorceress chains sprung from the fallen sorcery, binding the Primarch in place. The lion looked upon a son that had truly fallen. Seraphax, one whose face half burned permanently with chaotic fire. The Lion had promised not to react preemptively, to verify the taint, and now he saw it. The Emperor must be allowed to die, said Serifax. Death is only the beginning for one such as him. Only then can he ascend fully into the warp, as the true god he is. Once there, no longer enfeebled by the anger of his broken mortal body, he will destroy the ruinous powers and the wailing deities of Xenos races and oversee humanity's second great crusade. It was madness, a betrayal of what the Empress stood for. This was not the path, and how could the Lion trust in one so tainted by the warp? Baylor, another of the Fallen stepped out from behind Serifax, drawing the Lion's blood from a cut. Serifax would kill the Emperor and he needed a host to get close enough. And who better than a Primarch? He would puppet the lion's own body like a twisted marionette and create a mad apotheosis. The lion looked to the ceiling to see a twisted mirror that began to ripple. Pain soared through every nerve of his body as his soul was being dragged from it. His redeemed sons burst through the chamber doors and fired upon the twisting mirror only for Seraphrax to bind them too. Bevdan looked to the lion. There was so much more the two had to say, so many words yet not spoken, so many failures each had to forgive, but that would never come to pass. Bevdan made the choice and overloaded his psychic power, 
immolating himself to buy the lion a relief. The lion broke his chain and lunged at Seraphax, slicing his staff and pinning him to the ground. The lion roared at the sorcerer to release his sons. Balor, follower of Seraphax and fallen dark angel, looked on in awe. Never would he have believed the Lionel Johnson he knew would hesitate. Not the lion of old, who would have sacrificed his soldiers for the mission. The hesitation of the lion allowed Seraphax to bind him again. The sorcerer cackled in victory until Baylor slipped his dagger into Seraphax's gut. The fallen sorcerer spluttered and withered away, the mirror sorcery broken, and the runes and glyphs of chaos fading. The ten thousand eyes and Seraphax had been defeated, scattered to the depths of space. The lion was victorious. The redeemed and the lion rose to their feet and gathered around Baylor. The lion asked why. Why did he betray his master? He was no longer Seraphax. Not really. My brother held on to himself for so long, but when I heard him speak and saw how he had been altered, I knew he was gone. And you, you protected my brothers from him. That is not the lion who attacked Caliban. Baylor had turned from the corruption. He had seen his brothers, seen his Lord Primarch and had chosen them. But Chaos's roots had run too deep. The lion felt a sting in his heart. He didn't want to see more of his sons die. He was not that man who attacked Caliban. Not anymore. He was a protector, not the Emperor's annihilator. Baylor looked up to his lord and asked for a soldier's death. An honor the lion couldn't refuse. The lion cleaved his son's head from his shoulders. His heart steeled, but yet wreathed in the sorrow as he did so. The lion stood in the ashes of victory, the stark realization that his road ahead would be difficult. His return was a flare in the night sky, drawing allies and enemies to its light. But it was a journey he would not face alone. With the redeemed by his side, he would build, spread a web of protection that reached as far as he could, a shield for humanity, all under the protection of the lion, Lord of the First, Son of the Emperor, Primarch of the Dark Angels. The lion emerged once more into the forest pocket realm, looking for the wounded king. Before the strange castle grounds, he found a watcher in the dark. You told me before that I was not strong enough for this. He wasn't, but perhaps he was now. The lion stepped within, finding himself within a gloomy domed room. From the shadow he saw a figure emerge. The ferocity that lurks within the lion's heart is mirrored, but worn on the surface in the flashing blue eyes, those elongated canine teeth that are exposed as the upper lip lifts in a snarl. The lion looked upon Lehman Russ. Relief, anger, joy, and alarm all swell within the lion's heart. But Russ calls him a traitor and lunges at him. The lion meets with him toe to toe. Furious concentration against concentrated fury as a Primarch's doom. The lion battles until the figure transforms, seeing his long dead charismatic brother Horus Lupercal. The creature within transforms more throughout the duel. Perturabo, Jagatai Khan, Magnus the Red, all the lion's brothers taunt and maul him, ending with the monster that was Conrad Kurz. The ghosts of his brothers spill harsh words. Annihilator, old and weak, butcherer of his own sons, too late to save the Emperor, unworthy of the Emperor's secrets bio-engineered monster. The lion brawled with every one of his brothers, the remarks cutting just as deep as the Primarch level strikes. They were ghosts, but so was the lion that they knew. He was not that man anymore. He had chosen to become something more, something better than the Primarchs of old. A light flared from behind the lion, 
He turned and saw it, emanating from a kite shield. It was richly decorated and embossed with an icon of an eagle crowned with laurels. He reached out and touched it. His mind expanded to a perspective beyond his own, the galaxy. Humanity and Xenos upon millions of worlds. He saw life from the macro down to the organisms, all connected in a web of power whose perception caused pain to his soul. This was the mind of his father. This was how the Emperor saw the universe. It was incredible and haunting. The lion snapped back to himself, looking upon the Emperor's shield in his grip. He lunged forward and pinned the warp facade Night Haunter beneath the shield, the energy of the Master of Mankind within eviscerating the creature from existence. Perhaps he was all those things the creature accused him of, but now he could become something he chose to be, a shield in the darkness of the grim dark future. Reuniting with his sons and Avalus, the Lion detected a large fleet enter the system. Ships he recognized to be Astartes. The Blood Angels chapter had arrived. They had come to investigate the rumors spreading throughout Imperium Nihilus of a great knight emerging from a forest, battling the threats to humanity across desperate worlds. Descending down from a ramp, Space Marines in blood red marched in parade towards the hulking figure in ornate, deep green plate. What should have been a sight of hope turned the lion's heart into fury as he saw a warrior in gold donned in a mask that resembled the face of Sanguinius. Who are you to wear my brother's face? The lion bellowed, remembering the brother that he loved and admired, one now long dead in this rotting imperium. The warrior in gold removed his mask and the lion's anger subsided as he looked upon a space marine that was truly ancient. He sees the reminiscence of his brother's features, cast upon a visage that has seen too much war, a feeling he knew well. I am Dante, commander of the Blood Angels. I have served the Emperor for over a thousand years, and I have yet to meet a being with the same bearing as a Primarch, save for another Primarch, another Primarch. Rabute Gilliman lived. I am not alone. The lion's heart raced. Rabute, a brother, one he had clashed with many times before, but that didn't matter now. Finally, he had someone left in this rotting Imperium that could understand him. Everything he had been through. Gilliman was alive and lead the Indomitus Crusade across the Great Rift reinforcing bastions of humanity. It meant terror still stood. It still fought. It meant the Emperor still lived too. The Lion accepted Dante and the Blood Angels, and the news they brought with them, of a great evil amassing in the Somium stars, a call being answered by the chapters of the Unforgiven, the modern Dark Angels. They were in danger. The Lion gathered his redeemed angels and joined the Blood Angels fleet to his, as they roared towards the Somium stars. He had made a vow. I failed my father. I fear I also failed my brothers. I do not wish to fail my sons. He would not fail those who shared his blood and called themselves the Sons of the Lion. A pact sealed in Baelor's blood, a memory he had to honor. The Lion. The redeemed and the blood angels arrived in the system, finding the chapters of the Unforgiven in the heart of a trap set by Abaddon the Despoiler and Vashtor the Archivane, Demon of Chaos. The Wormwood, a twisted marionette reforging of the broken pieces of Caliban, hosted a foul ritual, desecrating rituals and blood splattered across its surface. A corrupted pseudo planet that felt the wrath of the Unforgiven chapters as they threw themselves upon the Black Legion, World Eaters and Demonic Forces. A cacophony of violence had shifted, as from the warp a blood-curdling roar echoed into real space. Tithes of blood coalesced, as the demon Primarch Angron broke into the material universe. Azrael, Grand Master of the Dark Angels held the Imperial Forces together, but such was the tide and ferocity of chaos, the lines began to buckle. 
until a vox com blared across the entire unforgiven line. Dante, Lord Commander of Imperium Nihilus declared that they bring aid. Your Jean Father has returned. The Lion has returned. It was as if time stood still. For thousands of warriors, their hearts beat like drums as the magnanimity of those words sunk in. Azrael and his men turned to see amongst the fire and smoke an enormous figure emerge, a cloak billowing behind him. He carried an ornate sword and shield and was clad in immaculate armor. Warriors of black and red swarmed behind him as the dark angels felt their blood sing with heat. They looked upon the myth made manifest and sunk to their knees, their Primarch, Lion L. Johnson. The Lion looked over the swamp of blood and corpses to look upon his fallen brother, the demon Primarch Angron, how far his tormented brother had fallen. The sight disgusted him. The Red Angel howled and flew upon his demonic wings at the Lion. The Lion raised his shield and took the brunt of Angron's meteoric slashes. Concussive shock waves blast from every hit as the duel began. The Knight of Caliban met the demon Primarch of Corn, as a sea of green and black armor pushed against the tide of chaos. For the Lion and the Emperor of the Sons of the Lion roared. The rampaging attacks of Angron were bone shattering, Johnson doing everything he could to deflect and counterattack. The Lion ducked and weaved through the structures as he now recognized to his horror. It resembled that of Caliban. The Lion and Angron exchanged more blows and wounds. The Lion using the Emperor's shield to emit golden light and reflecting the demon Primarch's titanic blows upon itself. The Lion weaved more, building the fury of his brother to apocalyptic levels, something he had counted upon. The power of Angron grew as blood poured for him, blood for the blood gone. His howls bursting eardrums and scraping at the soul. All semblance of tactics melted into a red haze as Angron made a reckless charge. Johnson joined his twisted brother and dropped his defenses, taking the brunt of Angron's charge but thrusting his blade deep into his brother's chest as they tumbled. The wounded monster looked up to see the bloodied Lord of the First rise. The lion loomed over Angron, armor bloodied and dented. He gripped the Emperor's shield with both hands and gave Angron no time to react. With a roar, Lionel Johnson brought the glowing edges of his shield down upon the demon Primarch's head, driving it through the bridge of Angron's nose with such a force that it embedded itself in the metal surface beneath. The lion banished his brother back into the warp. Through the forest walk, the lion returns to the fleet. The machinations of Vashtor had not been foiled. But the lion had saved his sons. Within the halls of the rock, the Dark Angel's fortress monastery, the remains of Alderic, before the chapters of the Unforgiven and the Redeemed, the lion stood. The Jean sons of the lion were reunited. The tensions of the hunters and those they had hunted for ten millennia was palpable. The great task of protecting humanity across the stars and bringing together his sons into one legion remains a difficult path. But the lion in his heart knows there is no more space for failure. He will not fail his father. He will not fail his brothers. He will not fail his sons. He will not rule, but he will lead those who choose to follow. For the Imperium. For the Emperor. For the lion.